I have this amazing honor to introduce someone um, who was the former CEO of the Vermont Electric Co-op. Um, she is currently leading all of the state of Vermont's broadband efforts. Uh, she also, um, in between those two roles, became the first openly trans uh, candidate for governor in the United States. Um, and she, um, after that, went to start a joint venture up in Canada. Um, she has endless energy. Um, as a trans person who works in spaces with very little representation, I'm super appreciative of her um, presence and also um, her fearless leadership. Um, she's made an unbelievable impact on her home state of Vermont, which is my former home. Um, and uh, she's, you know, also somebody I'm honored to call my friend. A um, little bit about her that you might not know. Uh, her uh, son made a documentary called Denial about um, her work and her life. And uh, she's kind of known for playing a, a tune on a piano anytime there's one in the room. Um, she is proud of that kind of like talent and will do it with or without an audience. So um, if you get a chance to meet, um, definitely ask about piano. Um, if there is a piano in this building, I'd like to see some performance. Um, but anyway, uh, I can't tell you how pleased I am to welcome her into our main cooperative ecosystem. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't be quite uh, a fun cooperative event without spilling water all over the podium. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, with, without uh, some tunes here. All right, everybody, Christine Halquist. So I am so honored to be here with you. There's so much goodness in this room. And you know, I'm here to share in uh, your inspiration and hope. And uh, I'm gonna tell the story about We Can, both on a personal level and an organizational level. That I truly believe that we collectively can do anything we set out to do. And I will tell you that, you know, if you, I believe that there's enough abundant resources on this planet that everybody could get housed and clothed and fed and health care if, if we all work collectively across the planet. There's, and, you know, there's some science behind that, too, because back in 2008, I was speaking about renewables at the uh, UVM Rubenstein School of Environmental Studies. And the person presenting with me was from Norway. And uh, we'll call him Jorge, or for, I, don't, I don't remember his name, but anyway. Anyway, he had developed this math model that accurately predicted all, all the uh, migration that was happening on the planet, the human migration, as well as accurately, precisely, the carbon. And he did that in the early 90s. So the, the model was very, very accurate. And one of the things he said was that the planet naturally could only house one billion inhabitants. But if we work collaboratively and cooperatively with the planet, it can house 11 and a half billion. So, I want us all to be thinking about, I'm sure you're all thinking about how we, how, uh, how we can take care of everybody on the planet. So a little bit about me, I've, you heard I play piano, but I live in this beautiful place in Vermont. It's, um, it's, the, it's the Green River Reservoir. It's, uh, I live on my driveway, seven tenths of a mile long, log home, been there over 35 years. As I've said, I'm, I'm in charge of getting everybody in Vermont connected to fiber optic internet. And we're going to do that in about five years. And this is, I want to talk about my electric boat. 
Last spring, my, my, I love to fish. My son loves to fish. My grandchildren love to fish. So my son borrowed a boat. We're on the Hudson River. And of course, I hate gas boats. They're smelly, they're stinky, noisy, and they, they take a lot of work. So we are coming back up the Hudson, and the gas line breaks. So I get some duct tape that happened to be there, and I hold the gas lines are coming in. I said to my son, I'm going to make an electric boat. So I go back to Vermont, and uh, one of my neighbors has you know, one of these big junkyards around his house, and he's got a boat laying there that's all black, and you know, it looked, but it looked pretty structurally sound. He had a couple of uh, trailers, boat trailers. I said, can I buy those boat trailers in that boat? And he looked at me like I was a little nuts. I said, I'm going to give them to you. So I took them home, cleaned them all up, stripped it down, started doing the electronics, the installation, the design. I've got more power in there than a Tesla power wall. So, so we're, I'm bringing it down to my son's house in Saratoga. I'm going to leave it there for a month and a half, go down on weekends, and we're going to proudly go up the Hudson with this electric boat. Not only that, uh, next week I'm going to put solar panels on it. So it'll be a solar-powered electric boat. So I'm going to go around this summer on the lakes and ponds of Vermont, proudly fishing in my carbon-free boat. And that ties to something that's carried me through life, pipe dreams. We all have to have pipe dreams. And I, you know, I, my f first uh, 40 years of life was hell. And, you know, it, it, it's, um, it, you know, it, I don't know what was going on with my brain, but ever since I can remember, I struggled. I had insomnia for the, I, I had panic attacks every day. So there was no respite from my brain. You know, even, because even, the only respite was when I did fall asleep. But, you know, my dad, he taught me an important lesson. And, I, and I'll get to that in a moment. But, you know, when you're walking through hell, you keep, you keep walking. And, and uh, I struggled for 40 years, but I'm going to tell you at the end of the day, it was all worth it. And anybody who's struggling, I want to make a point. Just keep going and keep that pipe dream. And that pipe dream for me was someday to find joy. And I certainly will tell you I found it, as you'll see. So I grew up in a uh, typical white rural town in northern Vermont, very Catholic, and uh, struggled with Catholic school because I asked far too many questions about the conflicts that I was hearing between the teachings of Jesus Christ and the Catholic Church. And uh, so at, in eighth grade, my parents got a call from the Monsignor saying, we think your child needs an exorcism. My parents did a wonderful thing. They said, there's nothing wrong with my child. They took all of their kids out of, seven kids, out of Catholic school and put us in public school. Good news for me, I didn't get beatings from the teachers at school anymore. I still got beat up on the way to and the way back from school. This was our house. This is a fun story. My dad, I, I think he had seven kids because he thought he could get all this free labor. He bought this house for $5,000. And uh, it, yeah, well, remember, it was in the, it's in the, seven, or the late, yeah, early, in the mid 70s. He bought this house. It was trashed. It was a mansion. And uh, we, so he used us kids. He taught us how to do drywall. He taught us how to do electricity, plumbing, powering concrete. Later on, I told my dad, you taught me the most important lesson of all. Don't buy a house that needs work. <laughs> but I love my dad, and I learned a lot from my dad. The most important lesson my dad taught me was this one. That house, every spring, the sewer would back up in the basement. And I, and I stuck with my dad everywhere we went. With the seven kids, I was always by his side because I knew he had something special. But we're down... We're down in that basement, and I would watch him do this in the spring. It was the most disgusting thing I ever saw. There'd be all this sewage. He'd take his shoes off. He'd take his pants and socks off. He'd wade into that sewage, and he'd run a snake down into that drain. 
And he'd struggle and struggle. All of a sudden, swoosh, everything would start draining. I thought, oh my God, that's the most disgusting thing I could ever imagine. When I turned 13, my dad said, okay, it's time for you to do this. <laughs> and I cried. You know, I'd, my father didn't, was not abusive. I had tremendous respect for him, so I did it. But I cried, and I'm waiting, you know, take, take your socks off, take your shoes off, take your pants off, because you, your mother's going to be angry if you, if you wear those. And I wade through, and I start struggling with that snake. All of a sudden, the sewer breaks loose, everything goes down. I thought, that was pretty cool. That wasn't, that wasn't bad at all. And that goes to the thing my father always said. Whenever I said, I can't do that, I can't do that, he would say, can't, never did. So, you know, I didn't, I was not, I was not very fond of school for obvious reasons. But I did go to a two-year tech school. And when I left that tech school, my roommate was working for a, a company called Digital Equipment Corporation. And uh, I went to work there. First thing they did is told me I was colorblind, so I couldn't have a job. I wanted to be a technician on the line. And uh, I said, go get me a pile of wire, and I'll identify those colors. Certainly the manager did, identified the colors, got the job. Late, you know, I'll, I'll kind of fast forward through the career because this is a story of my entire career. I, beca I ultimately became, an, after three months on the line, because my, I used to go to my work with my father. He was a microwave engineering designer at night. I'd be able to use the, the wave solder and do all these, develop all these circuits. So I'm looking at these power supplies, and I would call the engineer and say, why did you use that 10 meg resistor in that comparator circuit? It's going to cause failures. So they said, we're going to make you an engineer. And then later on, I wanted to be, there was this great job I wanted. And it, I got turned down because I was only a two-year tech, only had a two-year tech degree. But that, that job was involved NASA and, and, and building systems for them. So that evening, I knock on the door of a wonderful man, Kimbo Zonzanika. And I said, Kimbo, I can do that job. I said, this requires military specs. Open the, take that off and open to any military spec. And I'll tell you what it is and how. So he opens it up, you know, 883, thermal shock, 810, vibration testing. After going through this for about 10 minutes, he says, you got the job. So anyway, um, when I was 30, I, I, wanted, I decided that I wanted to be the the, uh, manu I decided to go into manufacturing. I wanted to be the manufacturing manager for power systems. And I got the job. Um, a month after getting the job, the VP of manufacturing came and said to me, we can get our power supplies for under a dollar a watt from Japan. You're a buck 87. You need to get that down in a year or we're gonna eliminate the whole, the whole organization. So I did the natural thing. I went out and found this little green book, Toyota Production System. I said, what are the Japanese doing? Implement it. That year I became the most valuable employee of 120,000 employees. And I actually became one of the earliest adopters of lean manufacturing in the country. This is kind of, at one point, I, when I started saying we need to, to create a revolution here and, and free ourselves from the, from the controls and free people's minds up. I was standing on the table with about 451 people. At that point, I think uh, a, lot, a lot of my peers literally thought I had lost it. But so anyway, after digital went down the tubes, I spent the next 10 years consulting with companies, you know, Miller Brewing, uh, I went in all the Keebler cookie plants, did a lot of food, food work. But my ultimate goal, at night, well, you know, I wanted to get back to, you know, my, my base, which is technology. And in 97, uh, Honda, who I thought was the greatest and most well-run company in the world, I saw they were advertising for a consulting firm to help them uh, improve the entire process of the automobile from concept to design to manufacturing. I said, I'm going to go get that job. So I call a friend of mine, we'll call him Carl, Carl, I said, I'll pay for your flight out to Ohio. Let's go sell Honda. He said, you're nuts. I'm not even, even if you pay for it, I'm not wasting that time. 
So then I called another friend, Prue. Prue, well, you know, I'll pay it all. Will you come out with you? Oh, okay, I'll come out with you. So we get out. There's this huge uh, gymnasium, and all the consulting firms were there. There were six other consulting firms, and they were like big ones, like Booz Allen, Arthur Anderson, and then us. And they all got their PowerPoint presentations, and I got this bag. And in that bag were toys, like rubber chickens, balls. <laughs> and at that point, I said, what have I done? <laughs> and we're, you know, Prue and I, nonverbals were, yes, I am crazy. But we proceeded. You know, they did all their presentations. There were five or six of them in suits for each group. I get all these out on the floor and start throwing rubber chickens. And, I've, it, and what I, the reason I did all that, we, you know, we, I learned through the years that you know, the best way to learn is by doing and having fun. But on the way back, Prue and I, we're, we didn't speak to each other. <laughs> Three weeks later, I get a call from Tomatsu Abe from Japan. We've decided to give the contract to your firm. I had to get composure. I said, why did you give it to our firm? Because you're the only one that made it fun. <laughs> so for the next two and a half years, Honda would fly me around one week a month. I'd do work for them. And I, got, I should have been paying them. They're so good. So um, one of the contracts I was working on, 12 miles from the house, was Vermont Electric Co-op, which was in bankruptcy. And uh, after about two years, they said, why don't you come run our engineering and operations? I said, this was my interview. I don't know how to design power, you know, power networks. I can design power systems. Oh, you'll figure it out. And they hired me. And that was a great opportunity. I knew it was going to be a great opportunity because the uh, electric utilities were about 10 years behind in the implementation of technology. They were technology greenfield. So we went to work. You know, the first thing we did, eliminate uh, paper maps, GIS, the system. We were the first utility in the country to do that right after the the GIS system was demilitarized. Next thing we do is smart meters 2005, smart grid 2007. 2010, I get a call from the Department of Energy, from the deputy director. Would you come down to Washington and talk about what you're doing up there? Sure. Thought I'd be meeting with two people or so. I get to this meeting. There's 25 people in there. They're all heads of the department of DOE. They told us we were the most innovative utility in the nation. So 2018, I get, I, I, I get really frustrated with this dumpster fire we call democracy. <laughs> so I said, I can't sit back and watch this. I don't care. I quit my job, ran for governor eight months before the election, which is far too late. Had no idea what I was doing. Got a couple of young people to work with. Went to work every day you know, using the phones. Pay, pounded the pavement, and we won the Democratic primary. Here, and here I am running against the most popular governor in the country. But I'll tell you, eight months of you know, bad food, no sleep, high stress, and no exercise, it was one of the most remarkable things I've done in life. It was very exciting. Didn't let the dust settle too long. After, a month after that, I went to Canada to chase another dream, working with the Canadian government at University of Sherbrooke. And that was to develop a new porous silicon battery that was four times the density of lithium ion for the electric grid, because we need storage for the electric grid. But that, you know, we, we got 600 samples out there. We were having problems getting it cost effective. COVID hit, went back to the house and decided it's probably, this probably isn't going to happen, but I'll keep working. I got a call from one of these communication union districts, which I'll talk about in a minute. They, uh, they asked me if I would uh, be their executive director. I said, sure, that'll be fun. And then I got another call from another communication union district. Oh, yeah, I'll do that for you, too. Last July, the governor, who I ran against, called me and said, we do this for the entire state. I said, sure. How could I say no? That's actually the picture of the, <laughs> what was great about this, can't, company in Canada, the strategy was, so this is the Canadian border running right through the middle of the factories. My office had Canada on one side, United States on the other. And the strategy here, the reason I went to Canada, because the Trump administration 
didn't care about renewals. So I figured, oh, we'll go work in Canada. And then when the administration changes, we'll just move over to the other side of the border. <laughs> now let's talk about we. That was about, I just wanted to give you some, some you know, that, that I'm, I'm a two-year associate's degree person. You know, I'm, I'm not some master's or PhD and been able to do some really incredible things. One reason. Anybody know why? You're bad. What? No. Not, well, I am bad, but. No, your dad. Oh, my dad. I thought you said I'm bad. <laughs> I, yeah, I know I'm bad. But. Yeah, go ahead. Just believe you could? Believe I could. Yeah, it's really simple. And we believe we can. And if you think about the co-op, right? I, I worked with all kinds of, uh, cor on the corporate side. But I came to the co-ops, and I have drank the co-op Kool-Aid. <laughs> and if you look at, if you, if you, and I'm not saying, I'll, I'll get into it, because there's been some really bad co-ops. But if we think about that first Rochdale cooperative and the seven cooperative principles, 1844. Farmers got together. They needed to sell their wares. They formed a co-op. Seven cooperative principles. And you know, if America's electric co-ops, I ultimately, became the chair of the Business and Technical Advisory Committee for the 900 plus co-ops that serve 42 million members across the country. Um, it, it, so, uh, you know, that was my next dream. In 2007, I said, I, I want to get on this group because they're the leaders, shakers, thinkers for 56% of America's landmass. But ultimately, when I left, I was the chair. Um, but, you know, I think about the excitement those days when we were connecting electricity to every address in America. Nine out of 10 of the milking parlors didn't have electricity. Think of the revolution that we created for agriculture by getting electricity into those milking parlors. Now, I read lots of stories and I thought to myself, wouldn't it be so wonderful to have been around during those times of the early co-op days? All that volunteer spirit pulling together to do a great thing. You know, forgive my bias, but I think it's one of humankind's greatest work. Um, but guess what? I'm doing that today. Vermont, what we did, we, the, our legislature de decided that we're going to build fiber to every home and business, and we're going to do it with communication union districts, and they're going to be community owned. So we have nine districts. Right now, there's actually 208 member towns. Uh, 404 volunteers working throughout the state, working together to get fiber. And the other towns that aren't members are now saying, we want to be there too, because they're seeing the power of volunteerism. And of course, those are the seven cooperative principles. Think about the timelessness of those principles. 1844, they were developed. Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed executive order in 1935 saying, we're going to have electric cooperatives throughout the entire United States. 900 plus co-ops following these principles. And today, you all are working with the same principles. I'm here to, well, I talk about co-ops, you know, it, I don't want to uh, completely draw a rosy picture of co-ops because they're run by people, right? You've got good leaders and bad leaders. It's the culture. This is all about the culture. Talking about my own personal sex success, it wasn't my training or my talent. It was my belief. And that's what you as leaders have to do. You focus, your culture has to be focused around those seven cooperative principles. I call this the shmoo of core values. And what I, I'm going to talk about this shmoo. What, what this is described is, you know, I've got my pipe dreams. And you all need to have your pipe dreams. But you, you don't share your pipe dream because you're going to scare people. It's all about incremental improvement. You know, it, we, did, we didn't become the most innovative utility in the country. We eliminated paper maps. We decided to put, install smart grid. You know, I had this vision of a totally automated and technical company, but I didn't share that because I knew the, employ you know, the employees were coming from here. Our job is always to push those schmoo of core values and keep it moving forward. And how do you do that? 
Well, let me talk about uh, the good and the bad but to go there. If you, if you don't, if you as a leader aren't out there practicing and checking on that culture every day, you'll end up with chaos. And I've seen it all with the co-ops. I've seen, I've seen uh, line workers lose their limbs because somebody took shortcuts in design. I've seen line workers injured because somebody took shortcuts in construction. And I've seen and personally had to go to a person's family because somebody took a shortcut in safety and a line worker died. So you, you go to a, some house, and you tell their, their spouse and their children that their parent just died. That leaves a lasting imprint. I've seen, I've seen uh, um, all kinds of unethical, unethical behavior with CEO, CEOs across the nation. CEOs taking kickbacks, getting additions put on their house. So that, you know, that's chaos. Leadership. I'll give you a couple tips for leadership. First, mo most important, one-on-ones. 107 employees at the co-op I met with every single one of them at least once a year. Sat down with them. My first question to them is, what's your dream job? Because we're going to help you get your dream job. I don't even care if it's not here. Because if you're working for your dream job, you're going to be excited and you're going to do great work for us. And then got into the questions around, what problems are you running to? What can I do better as your leader? The, um, certainly getting out in um, um, daily huddles are critical. To this day, every morning from 8.30 to 9, I have a virtual daily huddle with everybody working on this system. Because, and the, and the first question I ask and, uh, is, how are you doing? How's it we doing? And at the co-op, all, everybody at the co-op, all 107 employees were on the phone from 7 to 7.15 every morning. First question we ask, somebody share a safety tip. Somebody share a near miss that happened to them, either at home or at work. Because we want you to be safe. And whether you get hurt at home or at work, it's irrelevant. We want you to be safe. What's that message? The message is we care about you first. Now we can talk about the process problems and the other problems. And of course, celebrate success. You know, look at those core values and look, go out and find success. You're not looking, you know, yeah, there's five to seven percent of the population are psychopaths. But the majority of people get up every day and want to do a good job. The majority of people knew when they screwed up. You don't need to tell them. Someone else is telling them, I promise you that. You're going to go out and take, bring joy and, and single out those successes. Successes like, like, like Emily and uh, Alex, who, who organized this, as well as Sam. Thank you for your great job on the technology here. You know, this, I got, you know, the first thing I do is go into a conference and say, most of the time the technology's got problems, and you don't want to find that out. Sam had it all under control. Um, and by the way, if someone comes in and asks for help, you stop what you're doing and give them help. It's hard for people to ask for help, even from their peers. And uh, I'll spend two thirds of your time outside of your office. First thing I did when I became CEO of the co-op is I, had, I took the lock off the office. Uh, and I, anybody, I put in, a, I put in a, a meeting desk and said, hey, when I'm not there, use it as a meeting room. Oh, by the way, if you're, you're in there, and I, I'll go find another place to go. Because most of my time, I'm going to be out talking to employees, board members, member customers. Your job is culture. Also, find your Kevin. Your Kevin is the person that will tell you the truth whether you like it or not. And my Kevin was a person who was on the spectrum. He couldn't lie. <laughs> So I was like, Kevin, what did you think about what I said yesterday? Oh, it was stupid. <laughs> Thanks. Why was it stupid? And then he'd tell me why. You know, getting told that something was stupid is a gem. You know, it's a, and it's not just, if someone just says, you know, you're an idiot and can't tell you why, you know, that's not very valuable. But if they can tell you why you're an idiot, now you got a gem. <laughs> so I'm going to end with this. You know, we talk about music, and I've got this Ukrainian flag here.
to make a point. You know, I think music is an example of the beauty of the human spirit. Think about your favorite music and think about how marvelous it is that an individual or a group can come together and make such beautiful things. That's the beauty of humanity, right? But at the same time, we have Ukraine. And your choice every day, every moment, is the choice between good and evil. You know, and, and it's, so please, choose good. And I'm going to share this, a song for you at the end. Wait, spinning wheel. <laughs> yeah, they need fiber optic to the building here. Thank you.